When I was a kid, I was a big reader, and I mean to an extreme degree. There were weeks when I would blast through two, three, maybe even four books depending on the length. I had most of the kids section read at the library, and I could tell you about most of the novels in the young adult section as well. One year, I read somewhere in the ballpark of 230 novels. So trust me when I say I know what it feels like to have your favorite novel chewed up and spat out by the Hollywood machine, because nothing from my childhood was safe. My first big heartbreak was Aragon. As an adult, I can tell you that Aragon honestly wasn't as good as I remembered. Teenage author Christopher Paulini basically just copied the plot of Star Wars and transplanted it into a high fantasy setting. But at the time, it was one of my favorite novels, which at age 13, I naively thought would be transformed into the next Lord of the Rings when a movie was announced. Weaknesses of the source material aside, the film was a shoddy, low-budget affair that gutted most of the story and characterization that elevated the original material, leaving a shallow husk in its place. It's almost like they were trying to make it as lame as possible. I suffer without my stone. Do not prolong my suffering. These freaky ram creatures called Urgles? Psh! Forget that, just make them fat guys and eyeliner. Any real emotion, themes, or subtext from the book was boiled down to hammy acting and rush scenes. It felt more like an episode of Xena Warrior Princess than the next Lord of the Rings, and I was honestly crushed. Only to be crushed again with the release of the cheesy and over-the-top Alex Ryder movie, a watered-down Redwall cartoon from PBS, the Inkheart movie, and the abomination that was Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief. Now, there were a handful of diamonds in the rough. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was good, and even though I didn't actually read the books as a kid, I'm glad the Harry Potter films are pretty good adaptations for the most part. But after a little while, I began to feel grateful every time one of my favorite novels got sent to development hell. Which brings us to 2020, as Artemis Fowl, one of my all-time favorites as a kid, finally escaped development hell and got turned into this. What the heck is this? Everything, and I mean everything, about this is wrong. The first novel is supposed to be like fantasy diehard, with the main character actually serving as the villain, which sets up an amazing redemption arc over the next few books. But no, Disney couldn't let their main character be a villain because kids wouldn't understand that, even though they bought this very popular series of children's books because it was popular. So instead, Artemis is now the good guy, basically just a watered-down Harry Potter. Holly, the foul-mouthed elf secret agent fighting to prove herself as the first-ever female agent of L.E.P. Recon, is now a sweet, wide-eyed little girl pretending that she's actually a grown-up secret agent. And now Commander Root is a woman, totally undermining Holly's entire motivation in the book as the first-ever female L.E.P. Recon agent. Suddenly, Mulch Diggums, the dwarf, is an abnormal normally large dwarf, which just makes him a human being. Seriously, were they trying to make every single fan of this franchise mad? This begs the question, why do adaptations suck so frequently? People say the book is better than the movie, and they're usually correct. Why does Hollywood seem intent on taking something popular and then completely changing it? As though it's popular enough for them to make money off of, but also garbage that they need to change and improve. It makes no sense. If you want to make money off of fans, then why make creative decisions seem designed to piss off those fans? Well, to understand, you kind of have to know how movies get made. Films rest in this uneasy gap between art and commerce. Even the cheapest films are incredibly expensive to make, and while filmmakers do make art when they make films, every film that goes in production is literally like a corporation being formed. It's not a book or a painting where one artist makes something and then sends it off to get sold. Instead, every production is a gargantuan effort requiring hundreds of people to put together. Millions and millions of dollars are poured in and you have to assemble what is essentially the entire corporate structure, hiring the CEO, the CFO, all the way down to the secretary and the janitors with a parent company supervising the formation of this new gigantic business. Except in this case, the business is designed to craft and sell one product one time, so for it all to work, that product has to be killer. 
Enter adaptations. You got a book, video game, or comic book with a massive fan base? Great, let's just use that product as our product, and everyone who liked that product in its original form will now like this new product. However, adaptation or not, films often fall prey to too many cooks in the kitchen. The studio wants to find a director or writer or producer to adapt the work into a good film, so they pick someone with a good track record and set them to work. But no matter how skilled that filmmaker or writer may be, they may be the entirely wrong pick. Kenneth Branagh is a good director, he's directed plenty of good films, but that doesn't mean he was necessarily the best pick to direct Artemis Fowl. M. Night Shyamalan wanted to make The Last Airbender because his kids loved the show, but when you watch the film, you can see that big budget fantasies aren't exactly his wheelhouse. On the other hand, if you looked at Peter Jackson's filmography before The Lord of the Rings, none of his schlocky horror films would have given the average person a clue that he would have been the perfect director for this trilogy. And yet his passion for and understanding of the material made for a perfect match, creating one of the best trilogies in film history. But the Hollywood studio system further gums up the works from there, because it's seldom just a matter of finding the right filmmakers to tackle the project. Sure, you might have the perfect director, writer, producer, right down to the perfect sound mixer, but films are all too often mired in studio politics. Just because one studio executive understands the appeal of a particular property and its potential doesn't mean that everyone will or does. For example, in their book Writing Movies for Fun and Profit, Thomas Lennon and Robert Ben Garrett detail their experiences writing Herbie Fully Loaded. They had a vision for a sweet and sincere update of the old Herbie films that won the affection of a high-ranking executive at Disney. She enthusiastically greenlit the project, and they set to work on the script. Problems arose, however, when a lower-ranking executive who did not understand their project decided that it needed more silly gags to appeal to children in the audience, like making the car smile. Before they knew it, after a few drafts under this executive, their script no longer bore a resemblance to the film they had pitched. The executive who greenlit the project saw this new terrible script and fired them. The script went through several more drafts with several other writers before finally being released as a highly mediocre reboot of a beloved property. This sort of thing happens often in the film industry, and it's all the more clear in the case of adaptations. When a bad movie comes out, you just kind of write it off as a bad movie. Movie. But when a bad adaptation comes out, you can see in crystal clarity what it should have been versus what it wound up becoming. And this is because, as much as we love to talk about the auteur theory, it's a myth. Every single film has dozens of executives, junior executives, financiers, CEOs, producers, actors, and department heads that a filmmaker has to work with and answer to. In Lennon and Garrett's book, they describe directing as making a souffle while five other people who've never made a souffle watch and tell you what you're doing wrong. Every creative decision is run through countless people. First the writer, then the director, then the producer, then all the way up the chain. Just because the writer, director, producer, costume designer, composer, and most of the executives are all on the same page, all it takes is one person who just doesn't understand the spirit of what is being adapted to ruin everything. With so many cooks in the kitchen, it's on honestly shocking that anything ever gets made, much less made well. And you can see how what you love about an original property can get so twisted and bent out of shape in such a model. It's like playing telephone, except instead of repeating a word over and over and over again, it's repeating ideas. This is how we wind up with films, again, like Artemis Fowl, where they just decide to abandon the premise of the original story about a boy criminal genius and just make him die at Harry Potter instead. You can see this in the quality drop-off between The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, where Peter Jackson had almost unlimited creative control on the original trilogy, only to be rushed and saddled with creative conflicts on The Hobbit films. Did you notice how the MCU had a few really not great sequels early on, like Iron Man 2 and Thor The Dark World? And that in Phase 3, suddenly things got really weird, creative, and ambitious, like in films such as Thor Ragnarok, Black Panther, and Guardians of the Galaxy 2? Yeah, well, that's because Kevin Feige, a producer and executive who actually 
understands the properties he's adapting, was butting heads with the head of Marvel Entertainment, Ike Perlmutter, who was hemming Feige in at every turn. He's the cause of many of the MCU's biggest issues, likely the reason Edgar Wright got kicked off of Ant-Man, and he decided that a Black Panther film couldn't possibly be successful. So when Marvel Studios was bought by Disney, Feige asked if he could subvert the middleman and just report directly to Disney chief Alan Horn. And just like that, wouldn't you know it, the movies got better and did a better job of adapting the comics. It's almost like when the person in charge of adapting properties is a fan of those properties, they please fans and make money. Who knew? However, even when the stars align and everyone is able to agree on a creative decision, other issues like budget constraints or unforeseen problems can cause all sorts of issues. You might have all the intentions in the world of adapting something faithfully, only to find out that you don't have the budget for the costumes or sets or CGI that you want. Aragon is a good example of this, with a much smaller budget transforming the incredibly expansive dwarven halls into less than impressive caves. Monsters like the Urgles and Razak transformed into just normal people and the Helm's Deep-esque final battle into something much smaller. But let's say everything is perfect. You have a huge budget, no hurdles on set, and with a studio and creative team totally devoted to the same creative vision with nothing held back you still have to deal with the fact that an adaptation is indeed an adaptation. Moving anything from one medium to another is going to necessitate changes as different mediums have different functions, different strengths and weaknesses. For instance, length. Your average screenplay looks like this, and is usually between 90 and 120 pages, formatted in such a way that every page equals roughly one minute of screen time. Therefore, your average movie is between an hour and a half and two hours, maybe two hours and 30 minutes for a huge blockbuster. But you can immediately see the issue. Pick up any novel at a bookstore and you'll quickly find that the vast majority of them are over 200 pages, usually over 40,000 words. There is no way that you can squeeze 200 plus pages of material into a 100 page manuscript without cutting something. A good example of this is The Christmas Carol. A tremendously short novel at 30,000 words, it's almost more of a novella than a full-fledged novel. My personal copy that I own is about 150 pages long, and this makes it perfect for a film adaptation. Watch almost any of the numerous film incarnations of this classic and you will find that most of them are a word-for-word -word adaptation of the book, adapting everything faithfully to an extreme degree. And while that book is very short for a novel, most of these films clock in at an average film runtime. So a minuscule novel is roughly equivalent to a typical length movie. And since most novels are much, much, much longer than this, this quickly becomes a huge issue as you try to make a compelling film out of a 500 page Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings novel. With Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, they attempted to circumvent this problem by splitting the final book into two parts, a decision which some liked but others felt created two very disjointed films. And even after splitting the two, they still had to leave stuff out. This is one of the reasons that short stories make such great films, with classics like Shawshank Redemption, Arrival, and Stand By Me taking famous works of short fiction and expanding them into film-sized stories. This issue of length is also true for video games, many of which contain eight hours or more of gameplay, and this is one reason film adaptations often suck. Trying to squeeze the story of a game like Mass Effect, Red Dead Redemption, or God of War into a two-hour movie would be like squeezing an entire season of Game of Thrones into one film, which is why Game of Thrones was a show and not a movie. It just would not have worked as a film series with the massive lengths of the books and humongous cast of characters. And it's why so many book adaptations have been turned into television series recently instead of films. The structure of a novel fits the structure of TV well, with each chapter ending on a cliffhanger much in the same way episodic television does. However, even in the golden age of TV, TV budgets seldom compare to film budgets. And so even with a massive budget like that of The Mandalorian or Game of Thrones, many large-scale novels and video games just can't be done in quite as magnificent of a fashion as if they were done as a film. 
And not all novels have enough meat on their bones for a TV show. Their structure's better fitting a film, but their length's still too long. At which point, you make a movie, but you still have to make some very difficult cuts. Which sucks, because eventually something important is going to get lost in the shuffle. In the Harry Potter series, the filmmakers did an incredibly admirable job of condensing the books, but we did have to lose tons of side characters, important details, and effective subplots. Like the total absence of Voldemort's backstory in the half Blood Prince, or the explanation behind the mirror in the Deathly Hallows, or most of the mystery surrounding Barty Crouch in the Goblet of Fire. There's only so much they could have done here with the time allotted to them. And length is far from the only hurdle you face when adapting something. As stated before, different mediums have different functions, different strengths, and weaknesses. Novels, video games, biographies, comics, and stage plays can have drastically different narrative structure than films, which can make adaptations adaptation difficult. Most films follow a three-act structure, but other mediums don't have to follow that format. A two-act play may not translate well into a three-act screenplay. A video game broken into different levels with millions of different side quests is challenging to fit into a traditional narrative. The first book in Stephen King's Dark Tower series never would have made for a very good movie, as it does not follow a three-act structure. Instead, it feels more like a collection of short stories at times. So, the film just got rid of most of that, making up something new and not great, largely taking place in modern day New York for some reason. Okay, and just as an aside, can we stop getting interesting fantasy based stories like this or pack even Sonic the Hedgehog and transplanting them into our present? It's lame. And beyond just structure, there's things that books and video games and stage plays can do that movies just can't. A stage play can just be two people on a bench talking. This is much less interesting in film form. In the original Artemis Fowl novels, there's a funny gag in which we discover that dwarves tunnel by unhinging their jaws like a snake, quickly devouring dirt and excreting it out their back ends. In a written format where all you can see is what's in your imagination, this is a funny joke and a fun addition to the tongue-in-cheek world building. But in a live-action feature film, this is horrifying. Maybe if it had been animated, but as it stands, this did not translate well. The appeal lost in adaptation. You usually can't hear the inner thoughts of our characters in films, at least not all the time. Which means you now have to find a new way to convey what our characters are thinking and feeling to the audience. So many book-to-movie adaptations have fallen flat for me and many others just because I couldn't connect with the characters as well because I wasn't being inundated with their inner reactions to every scenario. In the novel Dune, most of the tension and conflict is created by having the thoughts of every single character constantly telegraphed to us, explaining exactly how they are scheming against each other, giving us insight to who will fail and who might succeed, constantly upping the stakes. There are entire chapters where absolutely nothing happens visually, all of the conflict taking place inside a character's tortured mind, as he or she wrestles with their motivations. David Lynch tried to translate this literally into his film adaptation, with constant voiceover from our character's inner thoughts being narrated in every single scene. And it was obnoxious. It's something that novels can get away with that films can't, because one is a written medium and the other entirely visual. For another example, the novel Dracula is not written as a traditional narrative. Instead, it's a collection of journal entries and logs pieced together to form a broader picture of Dracula and what he is, almost like a novelized version of a found footage film. This, of course, would not make for a good movie, so every Dracula movie ever made takes the basic story the book tells, removes all of that narrative device, and translates it into a more conventional film narrative. This is another reason video game adaptations fail so frequently. With novels, you're making an exchange, the story you imagined now actually realized for you in real life. The non-visual, visualized. With video games, you have a visual medium in which you have an active role in the story. Once translated to film, you are removing the active portion of the experience, leaving behind only the visual experience and the story. And oftentimes the story only works because of the active participation. Participation. Without the jumping, flying, and fighting, the storylines of Mario and Call of Duty and countless other video games prove to be somewhat lackluster. But even if you get a property with a fantastic storyline like Tomb Raider or 
Uncharted or The Last of Us. If you remove the gameplay, you are left with the same great thing, just now missing a large part of the experience. Nothing is added. It's kind of pointless. This is why some of the better video game adaptations are the ones that take the world of the video game and craft a new story around it, such as the Castlevania TV show or movies like Detective Pikachu and Sonic the Hedgehog. Though, that being said, Detective Pikachu did take a lot of elements from the game of the same name. The sad truth is this approach doesn't just work for video games. There are plenty of adaptations that are fantastic movies that just use the source material as a jumping off point, and then they did their own thing. The Shining, The Bourne Trilogy, How to Train Your Dragon, all of these are terrible adaptations that bear little to no resemblance to their source material, and yet they are fantastic films. In fact, sometimes an adaptation can vastly improve its source material by changing a ton. It's widely accepted that the Godfather movie is far superior to the unwieldy novel that it's based on. Starship Troopers is a film that completely abandons the story, world, and themes of the novel upon which it is based to create something completely different, with values that are the polar opposite of the books. Meanwhile, David Lynch's Dune adaptation is insanely loyal to the book, and it suffers for it, making for a very long, bloated, weird, and boring movie. Sometimes, by shaking off the shackles of source material, a film can become something totally new and better suited for the silver screen. This is one reason comic book adaptations have had such a great batting average. Unlike a novel, video game, or stage play, in which there is only one incarnation people are familiar with, comic book characters have been adapted and readapted into new storylines and comic book runs dozens if not hundreds of times. There are millions of different incarnations of stories about Batman, Superman, and Spider-Man, often retconning or ignoring each other. There is no one version of Wolverine or Captain in America, allowing filmmakers to craft semi-new stories cherry-picking whatever bits of lore and storylines they need to make their film the best it can be. And the fans don't mind. For instance, people fully embrace Christopher Nolan's more realistic take on Batman even though it was very different from previous incarnations of Batman. It was just yet another slightly different take on a character that had been reinterpreted a million times. And so, as long as he stuck to the core of who the character was, fans were willing to see new versions of Batman the Joker and Bane. Meanwhile, fans still debate over how good the Watchmen movie is, because it was a one-to-one -one adaptation of a story that they loved and felt passionate about. Furthermore, even though Batman has been reinterpreted countless times, many fans did not take well to Zack Snyder's vision for the character, feeling he had violated one of the core tenets of who Batman was, mainly the fact that he doesn't kill in most variations of the character. Which actually brings us to the heart of the issue. Any adaptation will be a challenging one. That requires bending, stretching, and recutting of the material until it fits into a new format. But a good writer understands what's important is keeping the heart of the story the same whilst you move around pieces to better transform something into film form. The Lord of the Rings is again a fantastic example of this. It takes characters like Tom Bombadil, Glorfindel, and Baragon and, sadly, cuts them along with their great scenes. Where these characters intersect with the plot, other characters fill in. In the book, Glorfindel was the elf writer who saves Frodo from the Ringwraiths, so he was replaced with the more story-important Arwen so we could have a good introduction to that character. Tom Bombadil is a fantastic character with great scenes, but they just don't further the plot. So while it was a sad change to make, it makes sense. Likewise, the Scourging of the Shire was cut from the end of Return of the King because it just didn't make much sense for there to be a second climax to an already gargantuan film. The Shelob scene was taken from the Two Towers and added to the Return of the King to help balance out subplots. Scenes are streamlined, characters altered slightly, and yes, these things made Tolkien purists furious. But it resulted in a fantastic film trilogy that retains the core story, themes, and overall heart of the property, resulting in an incredible trilogy of films that are loved by cinephiles and book fans alike. And yeah, not every film can be the Lord of the Rings with its humongous runtime and extended editions providing more faithful adaptations for those who want one. And no adaptation will ever be perfect. But if the creators understand the material and keep the soul of a property intact, an adaptation can provide something fun for fans. Heck, maybe even improve it in some ways. I think the Hunger Games movie is better than the book. I feel Jennifer Lawrence's performance makes Katniss more relatable, and the added perspectives of the game makers, commentators, politicians, and audiences helped drive home the book's themes about reality television and how desensitized we are to the violence in media. Far 
far more effectively than the novel in my opinion. I feel Severus Snape is a much better character in the Harry Potter films than in the novel, with Alan Rickman playing the role in a way that just made it more believable that he secretly cared about Harry. Whereas in the books he felt more like a bit of a monster who tormented children and only helped Harry because he was still hung up on his high school crush. Sometimes those terrible changes that need to be made can help streamline a narrative, making it more compelling. But even if you can't necessarily improve on what's already there, the hope is that the core part of the story everyone loves remains. Can you imagine if the people behind Percy Jackson and the Lightning Thief or Artemis Fowl actually understood that they weren't just clones of Harry Potter, but instead brilliant action comedies more in the vein of something like Men in Black? Could you imagine if Inkheart had actually been a movie about books instead of a generic low-budget YA adaptation? What if properties like The Dresden Files, Tales from the Earth Sea, The Works of Terry Pratchett, and yes, even Aragon were given as much love and care and attention as The Lord of the Rings? What if video game adaptations of Assassin's Creed, Uncharted, Tomb Raider, The Last of Us, Mass Effect, or Bioshock had as much effort and risk put into them as the games themselves? When the source material is understood by the filmmakers, when it's not just a studio product, when it's not just a paycheck, but instead a passion project. The fans notice. They show up in droves. They make it a success. They campaign for it better than any marketing department ever could. An adaptation does not need to be perfect. It just needs to capture the heart and soul of what we loved about the source material in the first place. Hey folks, hope you enjoyed that video. If you enjoyed this, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Also, this video was edited in part by my friend James. Please go check out his channel. He makes some really great stuff and he is freaking hilarious. Everything funny in this video was probably him. Thanks and have a great day.